Uh, we're delighted to welcome you to this uh, evening's talk, The Pyramid of Souls, which explores the life and the art practice of the late artist Muhammad Din Muhammad, whose work, uh, The Voyage, is actually featured in our current exhibition, The Body, Body Politic and the Body. Um, Muhammad Din Muhammad um, is a Singaporean artist, uh, but he was born in Malacca, and towards the end of his life, he actually returned to uh, return to the state, um, but I think on this part of the side of the causeway, we don't know very much about the artist. Um, we know he was a Sufi, uh, he was a traditional healer, he was a painter and a collector of Southeast Asian ethnographic objects. Um, we are delighted to have with us this evening um, Shabbe Hussein Mustafa, who is Senior Curator the National Gallery of Singapore. Um, who has done um, a lot of research uh, on this artist and he'll be sharing some of his uh, sort of work with us. Um, Mustafa will be speaking for about 40 minutes and then he will invite the artist Ahmad Zaki Anwar who's here as well uh, and Zaki uh, knew the artist uh, so he will sort of join him in conversation. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming Shabbe Hussein Mustafa. Thank you. Thank you, Rahel. Uh, this, is a, this is actually a really good turnout. Usually when I talk about Dean, we have about four people in the, in the audience. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, thank you for, 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 for coming today, uh, especially at this time, you know, ungodly hour to talk about godly things, I suppose. That's the best way to do it. Um, yeah, so I think as Rahel uh, uh, sh uh, kind of shared earlier, I'll try and speak for about 30 to 40 minutes. I have a prepared script, so I hope you'll bear with me because I, I want to try and cover a lot of ground. Uh, but what I'll try and do is uh, perhaps not try uh, uh, to, to create a kind of a biographical context uh, for, for Din, Mohammed Din, but I'll just call him Din, uh, because Zaki, uh, we'll, we'll come over and uh, if you want to see Zaki in the 90s, uh, there's a lot of catalogs here as well. Uh, so please, uh, please come down and flip through them uh, as, as well. And it's, it's sort of part of the talk uh, to understand how uh, Dean operated in so many spheres, right? And no, none of those spheres somehow could contain him, right? So this is sort of what my talk is about as well. And uh, with regards to the title, Pyramid of Souls, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that as, as, as well. So I want to begin my talk today by sharing a couple of caveats. First, this paper was written in parts at different moments in time, and hence it may appear a little disjunctive. And I hope you will bear with me. Second, it has been written in the format of a series of fragmentary notes accumulated by myself over the past five to six years, each time I would evoke, invoke, and curate the artist Mahmoudin Mohamed. A lesser known Singaporean artist who was born in Malacca and received his art training at the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts, where he graduated from in 1976. And about Sufi, you know, I think the word does not need a translation. Muhammad Din's writings, paintings, and sculptures were heavily influenced by his lifelong practice as a Guru Silat and in terms of Malay martial arts, but also as a Pawang, which means herbalist or traditional healer. My interactions with Dean began in 2007, only after his passing, when his wife, Hamida Jalil, made a request to the National University of Singapore Museum, where I had just started working, I no longer worked there, to make sense of her late husband's collection of paintings, sketches, and artifacts. Whilst Mohammed Din was also known as a painter and sculptor trained at NAFA, one of the earliest art schools to be established in Singapore and then Malaya in 1976, what made him distinct was his engagement with nature, which extended his practice as a traditional healer. It was also said that Din's work operated as amulets with talismanic and healing properties. Each element of the artwork composed in specific ways, with particular formats, and always paying special attention to the requirements of his patient or his reader. 
And so as my documentation of his home continued, I soon discovered, apart from a series of mentions in the local newspapers and scattered short notes written by different art historians in brochures published on the occasion of the artist's many exhibitions, little, if any, art historical writings existed. Indeed, Muhammad Din had struggled to find a place within the art historical narrative of Singapore. I wondered what would have caused and what were the exact reasons for this. For he was a crucial member of numerous art societies. He exhibited regularly, produced prolifically. The state museums in Malaysia and Singapore collected his works regularly. Either there were not enough art historians, or as I soon discovered, looking through his home, I could not differentiate between his artworks, the objects that he collected, and the things that he used to heal his patients. This difficulty to compartmentalize continues to keep me fascinated with Dean and his many life worlds more than 10 years later. Dean's home was a critical site for his practice, where he and his wife, also an artist, Hamida Jalil, amassed hundreds of objects, as if forming a distinct allegory for island Southeast Asia that resists beyond what any museological framework can ever aspire towards. Dean would constantly gather objects from different sources and origins, seeking representation and often producing ideographic pictures that form diaristic gestures towards larger sculptural works, many of which remain unrealized. For example, this work called Nature and Nation. So these are images of Dean's home. It's a, it's a, a four-room flat in, 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 in Singapore. Of course, uh, these are the kinds of newspaper articles that I found. They were not about his art, per se. Eh? So he's being covered by the newspapers, but in very different ways. You can see the titles. Right? We, we can come back to some of these discussions a little later. That's uh, Dean over there in the corner. So the, the, the newspaper title is titled Medicine Man, but he's painting, right? So these sorts of. So Dean would constantly gather objects from different sources and origins, seeking representation and often producing ideographic pictures, as I have said. But knowledge systems and their access marked a significant point in Dean's practice. Through his work, he would constantly question as to whether there is a place for highly specific and localized tendencies in the art of the post-colonial world, and if indeed strategies may be developed to negotiate these sensitivities between diverse material cultures of the contemporary world. Now, um, the thing is that Dean is emerging in the 1980s when Singapore is getting very, very rich, right? So everybody's getting very rich. And so in a sense, he's operating within the city, within this kind of urban ecosystem. And so I think, I think this is something also uh, to keep in mind, that Dean was very much an urban uh, uh, kind of uh, creature, I suppose, you know, a, a, a figure you know, who operated within the city of Singapore. And I think he thrived uh, on it. Having noted that what did happen as I was documenting the home, as I was documenting the home, was the publication of an article in the academic journal Visual Anthropology that was authored not by an art historian, but, by, but an anthropologist, Douglas Ferrer, and titled Healing Arts of the Malay Mystic. So the, the paper is here if you want to flip through it. Published a year after the passing of the artist in 2008, and almost at the same time that I was working on the exhibition, which we'll come to in a little bit, Douglas Ferrer begins the article by discussing the influential theory by the British sociologist Alfred Gell, titled Art and Agency. In this text, Gell argues, using visual artifacts and objects as examples, the art enchants the viewer such that artworks not only me mediate social energy, but also abduct the viewer into the intentions of those who produce them. In 1992, Jell had also authored The Technology of Enchantment and the Enchantment of Technology, where he, 
exemplify the theory with the, and I quote him, the study of exotic customs such as idolatry, fetishism, and witchcraft. Douglas Ferrer attempted to use Jell's notion of art and agency to understand the art of Muhammad Din Muhammad. Ferrer argues that it was Dean's practice of silat which brought his paintings, sculptures, and traditional healing into a steady conversation. Now, please allow me to quote uh, Douglas Ferrer, the anthropologist. Open quote. For the most part, Mohammedin uses his paintings and sculptures to act as a kind of preventive medicine. For example, he uses, or he himself wears, a talisman suspended from a string about his neck made from wood with a petrified hailstone inserted in the back. The idea, he explains, is to have an upright alif on one's chest in the form of a miniature sculpture. Alif is also the first letter of the Arabic alphabet and represents a standing posture at the beginning of the Muslim daily prayer, which precedes kneeling and placing the forehead onto the prayer mat. From this vantage, silat is Islamic calligraphy in motion an idea recognized by Muslims worldwide. Incidentally, in the painting Alif, the image is also suggestive of the straight aristocratic Malay Chris of, and of a dragon's head. Let me show you the painting of the Chris. Yeah. Hence, Guru Silat Muhammad Din paints Zikr directly onto the canvas with his bare hands using his bodily movements of Silat as a transducer of divine power from the sacred to the profane realm, close quote. In other words, Farrell notes that Dean was challenging, channeling energy into his paintings that was unlike the kind of labor that any other typical modern or contemporary artist would work into their art. Although the publication of Douglas Ferrer's article, the anthropological article, and my documentation of Muhammad Din's home and the subsequent exhibition happened almost concurrently, the mode of working that we had adopted seemed to be quite similar. It appeared that both the curator, that's myself, and the anthropologist had been performing a similar role as we both negotiated through the issues of painting, sculptures, healing materials, and Malay, Asha, Malay martial arts practice, somewhat similarly, but in differentiated forms. The curator, as one who works within the setting of the museum, negotiating its gamut of problematics, especially the ranging debate about archiving non-European cultures. The anthropologist working within the setting of the university, as he or she seeks to engage with, chronicle, and unravel the culture of faith and living. In the context of my talk today, this moment of simultaneous con conversation with the same artist from two different perspectives raises a whole series of questions, which allow us to think through how one may problematize the act of curating in museological context, the limits of art history, and the role of ethnography in writing stories of art from Southeast Asia, a region that has historically been sandwiched between India and China, and is often only seen uh, in light of Western art historical techniques. That is to say, and my primary proposition is this, when curators deploy Southeast Asian art objects, both from the present and the past, they are always reminded about balancing the kinds of authorial regimes that the object is set to potentiate, but also the sorts of disciplinary formations that seem to govern their ability to historically frame the art object within a museological setting. To me, it appears that there is always this constant struggle between adopting a classificatory Western art historical model that, okay, everything is in compartments and that everything must make sense, vis-a-vis -vis the ethnographic. The ethnographic being a system that is perceivably based on the interrogation of cultural difference, a profound consciousness of the other, and appears to have contributed significantly to the study of Southeast Asian visual art. I would argue that the former, that is art history, seems to have limited the ability of Southeast Asian art to gain a foothold within global debates of modernism. And the latter, ethnography, whilst having allowed for a more local mode of interpretation to emerge, it has possibly also been the cause of Southeast Asia's non-appearance. So in a sense, we are somehow in Southeast Asia, we are caught between uh, the art historical formation and the ethnographic. And when we are sort of caught in between, we are unable to actually rise up because we are constantly just battling this, 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 this dilemma in, in, in our minds. My statement should contain a caveat that I do not lament this situation, nor do I seek a reproach of either disciplines. 
nor do I mean to suggest that disciplines today have remained distinct and not allowed for any interchange. But what I do seek is an opportunity to generate a peculiar curatorial mode of working that fuses and synthesizes these conversations together into a exhibitionary language, what Mohammed Din had referred to as the pyramid of souls, which I will come to uh, in a little while, what I may have described in other instances as the archival curatorial method. Now, let me also note that I'm not alone in trying to do this. What I want to discuss is a 2011 special issue edited by Joan Key and Patrick Flores, published in the journal Third Text, titled Contemporaneity and Art in Southeast Asia. In the introduction, Key begins by observing that the 1990s has been a significant turning point in debates about art and other regions. She observes that the decade marked by the flourishing of debates across Asia and within Euro-America brought artists from different localities together in a radically different manner. Joan Key tracks both institutional and historical debates about how one may capture this shift, this apparent contemporary moment and plausible state of postmodernity. While Key cautions against the casual use of the term postmodernity and even the term contemporary, for it means almost everything and nothing simultaneously, she discusses a conversation that had transpired between her and Patrick Flores as they set about establishing the parameters of this special issue during the initial call for papers. They both agreed to avoid the word contemporary. Flores is thereafter quoted, that the contemporary as a condition, an epoch, a paradigm, and even a placeholder remaining the similarly contested notion of postmodernity, contemporaneity, forces artists and writers to think that they perceive as the present as never before. Both Joan Key and Flores also seem to take up the provocation by the art historian Nora Taylor, who titles her essay in the same volume as the Southeast Asian art historian as an ethnographer, question mark. In the carefully crafted essay, Nora Taylor goes on to describe the difficulties she encountered as a graduate student when she visited Vietnam in the early 1990s to conduct archival research. It soon became apparent to her that conducting research purely through archival texts and access to artworks would prove difficult simply because of the manner in which knowledge systems operate in Southeast Asia, that is through oral traditions, and also the simple fact that art history did not exist in Vietnam at the time. As such, Taylor embarked on a simultaneous journey of not only studying the works of art, but also approaching the artists as an ethnographer, studying them as human subjects, such that she could not only assert with which artworks are significant, but also why, based on the role the artist had played within Vietnamese society. Taylor goes on to provoke further. Southeast Asian art seems to be in a permanent state of self-reflexivity over issues of geography and culture. If, there's something, if there is something inherent in Southeast Asian art that attracts anthropologists, or is it something about anthropology that lends itself to Southeast Asian art? I would surmise that it is a little bit of both and argue that there is something lacking in Western art historical models that they cannot account for certain issues surrounding Southeast Asian art. Anthropology is grounded in cultural difference. So it seems that we are constantly attracting all these anthropologists to Southeast Asia and they keep writing about art, which is, which is interesting. In his own essay, sorry, from a personal vantage point, I must admit that the recourse of, to the so-called ethnographic on my part was based on a self-reflexive moment when I interrogated myself in 2008 and the role I was playing in the home of a recently deceased artist. I also realized that Mohammedin's life worlds presented a curatorial opportunity to reveal the syncreticism that is Southeast Asia and offer a kind of clarification to the modern museum that Dean's objects will always appear to be larger than what they are, but also exceed the scientific rationalist vocabulary of the modern museum that seeks to encompass it. More so than this, what Mohammedin would also highlight is not simply the phantasms of the exotic, because you know, whether Mohammedin is exotic or not is a question to answer, the overtly obvious ethnographic self that he offered to his readers and also to the anthropologists, but the sorts of strategies that he would devise to subvert the very notion of the anthropological the ethnographic and even the so-called art historical. In some ways, he was akin to Homi Baba's comedian of culture's nonsense, standing in that undecidable enunciatory space where culture's authority is undone and remade, a sort of knee-jerk reaction to the curator, art historian, or anthropologist who attempted to ethnographically capture him. 
Indeed, it is interesting that the anthropologist Douglas Ferrer would note in his acknowledgement, sir, that accompany his 2008 article, and I quote him, Mohammedin Mohammed passed away in May 2007. He is survived by his wife and five children. He carefully read this manuscript and made several important adjustments. He said he found the article unusual as he was used to getting art reviews. But when I asked him with furrowed brow whether he liked it, he said, no, no, I love it. So in a sense, Dean would, 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 would speak to the anthropologist, he would also speak to the art historians. He would, like, you know, it's this kind of his ability, right, to move between all these different realms. But now let's re return to the 2008 uh, exhibition, Archives and Desires, for which the display strategy I had to devise, based on how Dean's objects, you know, within his home operated within a kind of a vacuum. The various floral elements juxtaposed alongside the wooden chests and cabinets all hovered over by this sculpture and paintings attempted to create a fluid space where the different elements interacted with each other in the hope of producing an aesthetic which remained representative of Dean's huh, life world, all the while acknowledging the artificiality represented by the museum and its taxonomic conventions. The approach to the archive was not just to capture a modernist duality between the rational and not so rational, or between what constituted science and what we could refer to as magic, but as a critique which sought to lodge itself in between such a dialectical space generated when objects defying museological and taxonomic classifications and collected with a seemingly emotional intent are forced to enter the archival process before they can be exhibited. Within a, muse within a museum. So for instance, you can see here, you know, the objects that he collected and the objects that he made, we didn't feel we had to differentiate them. We just kind of put them up. As such, the conflation and merging of the two terms, archives and desires, principally attempted to capture the different complexities and assumptions involved in what constitutes an institutionalized archival collection of art and artifacts which are collected along taxonomic norms and what forms a private collection based on a radically different worldview. Although the reader, the public, was not encouraged to touch the objects on display, the curatorial intent was to evoke reactions without much description. The hope was not to learn as much as wonder and connect with the experience in a very personal, emotive way. All throughout the exhibition, a curatorial anxiety played out that any attempt at capturing Dean's life may be understood as prodding a tight rope, rope, which can, at best, hope to solicit numerous questions of artistic struggle, but provide few, if any, clear answers. This curatorial conviction that developed over months of research conducted in Dean's home, as a result, an assortment of display strategies have been, had been adopted to enable the different artifacts to form an assemblage, where the entire space came to be conceived as discursively represented of Dean's, as, as a kind of a Mohammed Dean self-portrait. A conscious decision had been to not restrict the exhibition to any finished products meeting museum conventions, but display selections from the home via a method which refuses the law of producing a clear-cut chronological narrative. The curatorial appeal then was one of a kind of a syncreticism, visually constructed by each individual member of the public by fusing the different arrangements together in an attempt to understand Muhammad Din. But at the same time, acknowledging the artificiality and the problematics involved in the museumization of cultures. So in a sense, you know, I realize that the museums that we have today are like a headache and a headache that somehow refuses to go away is there. And you have this headache, you know, you can still drive, you can still go to work, you know, you can, you can still have lunch, you know, you can still watch TV, but it's a headache. It, it never goes away. And, and so I was trying to kind of, we're trying to cope with this headache, right, that we have created for ourselves, which is the museum. And how can we understand Din within all of this? Because he's so slippery, you know, the moment you catch him, is gone. So this is sort of trying to make sense of this. 
The central problematic was to attempt a futile enlivening which relied not just on letting the objects speak for themselves, but appropriating the composite energies in narrating Mohammed bin Mohammed via an aesthetic which seems hidden and evasive. To render such an aesthetic pliable required something like a leap of faith. Which brings me to my last case study, and I'll, I'll quickly wrap up. Camping and tramping traced the rise of the museum in British Malaya not just as an indicator of power over what was gazed upon as the exotic by acknowledging that the very advent of the museum in the 19th century, in 19th century Malaya, resulted in a staging ground for a project of accumulation and the ordering of knowledge. The significant challenge that camping and tramping, sort of learning from Mohammedin's uh, project, sought to overcome that was that most studies on, in, on museolo museology in Malaya have spoken little about what sort of an impact 19th century knowledge systems had upon the everyday lives of the colonized citizenry. It proposition, the exhibition proposition, that if the project of science had begun by targeting the colonized as an object to be transformed by the exposure to new forms of knowledge, those defined as superstitious could never be fully understood. Or for if they became completely intelligible, the project of educating them would have come to an end. It appears the advent of the museum in Malaya had opened a gap between those who controlled it and those it claimed to represent. As such, Mohammedin's materials and artworks became a significant contemporary reference point and were inserted into the exhibition placed alongside ethnographic and natural history specimens from the erstwhile Raffles Museum and Library in Singapore. So this is all the text right, that I begin to accumulate. And you can see Mohammedin was within uh, the exhibition, trying to highlight how, you know, it's, it's difficult. The, the muse museological project itself is inherently problematic. You know, so how do you overcome it? And it kind of sounds ironic because I work in a museum, you see? But, but that's the point, yeah, that one is within it in order to break it down. So for instance, uh, this is a work by Mohammedin titled Healing Bones. And that's the hide of an elephant that was shot in Johor, right? which I found in the natural history collection in Singapore. And within the exhibition, we begin to sort of look at also Dean as a writer, because he was also prolific uh, as, as a writer. And he, he wrote largely in English, which is quite odd. Um, so there's a, a lot of writings which you, you can also see here. I've, I've placed them here. But at the same time, we were grappling with the kind of uh, colonial approaches to commercial and scientific knowledge. So how does one actually make sense of this? Because both systems are operating within the same space. So this pursuit of truth and, 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 and knowledge, yeah? I mean, how does one actually get to that stage, right? So these are two completely different, or are they the same? I mean, these are questions yeah, that, that Dean allowed us to kind of raise. This is Hamida. Uh, so uh, Hamida, uh, the wife of Dean, who also has been a very important interlocutor uh, in guiding uh, the whole process. So she would come down and we set up the work. So this is kind of a relationship with, with the artist's uh, family, I suppose, that has continued to, to this day. The work that she's setting up is titled The Soul Searching Vehicle. So in a sense, you know, you have this object, which is a soul searching vehicle composed of very, very different things, you know, uh, alongside very formal museological objects, you can see. And I think, I think Dean, um, as I realized, was not exclusive uh, in his knowledge. You know, he, he, he was not like, oh, I, I reject anything that comes from outside. No, in fact, it was extremely syncretic. 
So for instance, he would even read like this, this PhD thesis by somebody called Terry Willard, who wrote a book on herbs of spiritual potency and medical wonder. So you know, it, 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 he's able to absorb, yeah? Uh, not just the knowledge that he acquires from within and, 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 and from his, his, his kind of uh, pursuit for knowledge, but also from those that are from outside of that very knowledge system. You know, so even reading something like prescription alternatives, yeah? So it's, it's, it's complicated, to say the least. So I'm going to quickly uh, wrap up, actually. Um, and I'm going to try and present uh, kind of a, a, a theoretical uh, question, yeah? uh, which I sort of uh, pick up from uh, the writer Gayatri Spivak, uh, who calls it uh, affirmative uh, sabotage. Yeah? So how does one deal with institutions, you know, the, the headache right, that I had all those years ago? And uh, there is this wonderful quote uh, that I found. So it's called, let's think also of affirmative sabotage of regularly hybridized European enlightenment thinking, corrected in the process, turning poison repeatedly into medicine, since we are already contaminated uh, historically. So, so I think maybe the, 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 the pursuit of purity <laughs> is maybe the problem. And maybe Dean was also pointing to this, you know, to think that, oh, there is some kind of pure knowledge, maybe uh, something to, to think about and wonder about, especially in, 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 in today's climate, right? As things continue to change so fast yeah, around us. And so this is how uh, I see uh, uh, the kind of affirmative sabotage yeah, being activated. And this is uh, what I wrote recently, yeah, based on an ex a moment I experienced all the way back in 2008. So I hope you bear with me. Uh, walking around a small-sized closed room in Clementi, Singapore, of a recently deceased artist, with aging, creme-colored walls, which he has possibly never painted, odorous with the nuances of an enclosing artistic space of production, accumulations and thought, a helpful locus for the curator to solidify the concept. All seems well. Probing, a tracing is, is recovered from under the artist's bed. On it, an assemblage is composed, proposing a union of various sculptures the artist had constructed over his now abruptly ended life. The assemblage is titled Pyramid of Souls, attesting to that of a perfectly balanced votive stupa an architectural system developed from the pre-Buddhist grave mound, under which the saintly ascetic were buried, their bodies seated on the ground and covered with earth. The artist, however, resists using the word stupa, for he himself is declaredly a hybridized creature of European Enlightenment thinking, and the term pyramid shall suffice. The pyramid is composed of sculptures assembled with coconuts, metal wire, wyankulet, horse hairs, other salvage ephemera, old computer tables, bones, coral, precious stones, wood, and herbs. At the bottom, a statement is inked. I quote him. Every soul will look for its true self, despite the shapes and sizes assigned for its manifestation. Some will get lost along the way, and some will find their true self. As for me, the search and the pain is divine by itself." Close quote. The drawing is signed and dated. Its authenticity remains intact. The pyramid is an altogether radical tradition, and more radical with the stupa, as they work together with things, pictures, paints, nails, installatives of the artist. This is exactly not conceptual art. Even the references to its own visuality, the bits of monochromatic lines laid out in white space, the plangent glows of the stupa made up centrally by the alif, a once deteriorating stump that has taken on form as a sculpture, seekingly protect the trace away from the promise of the sign 
with denials of the conceptual, resisting the curatorial, but concomitantly asking for my embedding within this scheme. I cannot help but think the mystery of the sketch. If it was ever meant to enjoy the allegory of reading, or simply retained as a beckoning trace. For the artist, by then, had already become accustomed to repeatedly turning detritus, things that he found, into medicine, and constantly provoking that we are already infected historically. I begin to sense that my rhythm is pulsating. My eyes pace around the room and the pressing in of the pale walls, the doors that hold them in opening and closing. This is too aphoristic. I must get back from the tracing huh, to the room. So in a sense, I think uh, Dean is, 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 is very much aware. Yeah? And maybe I, 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 I kind of close with this <laughs> photograph. And uh, I think this is sort of uh, Dean in his, uh, in his, in his best mode. So uh, this is a series of photographs that he did unpublished, um, which I found where he was in Paris in 2001, um, and he's walking around the flea markets, and he finds this African mass, and he begins to sort of compare the mass to himself. Eh? And there's like a lot of these photographs. And uh, in a sense, I think maybe Dean is the cure eh, to my headache, yeah? because uh, I think there are all these fantastic strategies in the way he worked. And um, I thought perhaps uh, we could continue uh, discussing uh, with, 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 with Zaki. So uh, please join me uh, in welcoming Ahmed Zaki Anwar as well. Thank you. Did some of that make sense? Yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> how, how, how should we start? Um, I don't know if this is your talk. You, when, when, you okay, when, when, did, when did you meet him? Uh, um, I, I knew Dean um, for a very long time, actually. I, I met him when he was still a student. He was studying art at the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts in Singapore. I was studying art here in Kuala Lumpur, so we met through mutual friends. So we became very close um, right to the moment that he uh, died. Yeah. There is a, there's a quite a funny anecdote mm -hmm. that I was told about uh, Dean at uh, Nanya Academy of Fine Arts. Yeah. So Georgia Chen, one of the Singapore painters, was his tutor. Yeah. And she came up to Dean and said, gosh, you really can't paint. <laughs> <laughs> And he said, I know, <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but yeah, yeah. yeah. But what sort uh, he of, told me that. He uh, told you this yeah, anecdote. He told yeah. me that, that um, uh, she thinks that he'll never be an artist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe that's the best kind sometimes, <laughs> right? But, yeah. but, but, but what, 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 what sort of conversations uh, did you often have? Because I know that you, you, you shared uh, a lot of sensibilities, right? Mm. And, and of course, you were in Johor at the time. So. Yes. Yeah, I was in Johor. He was in Singapore. So we visited each other quite regularly. Um, but, you know, to, to understand um, what Dane is doing is that um, to know how serious he is, right? I mean, most people would know him as an artist because that's his most public image. but. If, if you were to hang around um, in his house, you know, um, you see a, a stream of people coming to see him. Um, patients, actually, you know. I mean, so he actually treats people with, uh, you know, someone who has diabetes or um, someone who has a bad back, because he also does uh, therapeutic uh, massage, you know. 
Um, and um, when he prescribes, you know, he not only prescribes um, things like herbs or, or um, perhaps a, a massage, but he he can also prescribe things like, um, um, let's say, he will read verses from from the Quran. Um, into a bottle of water, you know, so that, that water becomes a medium to carry the, the, the blessing, and the water is given to the patient, and, and the patient drinks it on occasion. So that kind of thing, you know. So people who come to see him sometimes not only suffer from um, um, from ordinary illnesses, but sometimes they come to. Uh, mm, recover someone they have lost, you know, um, or to attract someone they're in love with, you know. So then actually does deal in, 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 in magic, actually, you know. So what he does is very real. It's very real to him, you know. But I think what he wanted most, um, what we always talk about was how to bring these two worlds together in his art, you know, because he knows he, he cannot bring art into the healing world, but he knew that he can bring that, this, this healing world into his art and use it as a material. So that was what he, 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 he really wanted to do. And, and, and I think towards the, uh, towards the end, until the end, he, he struggled to, to to make it legitimate, you know, to get an acknowledgement for that. But I think for most uh, contemporary art um, curators, very few, I think, has recognized that, like, uh, apart from you, you know. But a lot of young curators, you just cannot get into his work, you know, just, they just cannot um, understand it, you know. So I think that remains um, something that, 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 that he was, um, not to say disappointed with, but it was something he wanted, yeah, to bring these two worlds together. You know, I mean, we were talking about, you were talking about the museum and, you know, I mean, when you put an object in the museum, um, in the real world, it, it could be an ordinary um, kitchenware, you know, but in the museum, it's put on a pedestal as, as a work of art, you know. Um, and a lot of times, the, the, the purpose, the function of that thing is forgotten. Yeah. I, re I remember going to a, a museum with, uh, with Putu. You know? Putu is Hindu, right? We were, we were in Los Angeles and we went to a small museum where they had a lot of uh, Hindu gods. You know? And Putu was absolutely like, you can't believe why they're putting his gods in the museum, you know, to him it's out of context, you know, it's out of context. But, but, um, and 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 um, I think that that dichotomy will always exist. Yeah, when when um, you try to put something which which is what you can say real or or, or functional and. In the museum, it suddenly becomes an aesthetic object, or you know, yeah. And and, and, and this is this is also what I kind of discover, yeah, that as I am, I am also documenting the home with uh, with uh, with uh, Hamida and mm. and the children. Yeah. Um, and that's actually when I met you as well for the yeah. first time. Um, the the wife and the kids would tell me that, oh yeah, we have all these objects. Uh, this we don't know where it's from. This we think we know it's where it's from. This may be from here, but we are not so sure. Yeah. And they celebrated that, that, yeah. that they didn't have complete knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And, and, and somehow I think this is also the, the inherent problem within museums today, that we, 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 we tell our publics that, oh, we know everything. Yeah. Right? That we must have complete knowledge, but this is not true. It is, it is a kind of a, a, a fallacy yeah? mm. that, that museums continue to perpetuate yeah. this idea of completeness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
and, 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 and this was something that I discovered mm. through him, that these objects are there, yeah, and you can use them and you can, you can, they can function or they could be something that you keep. Yeah. Without... Yeah, I, I mean, um, when... Uh, we travel a lot together, you know, and he loves looking for... for he loves foraging in, in the forest, for example, looking at roots, uh, barks of trees, you know, the bones of animals. That's where he collects all these things. Yeah? Um, and, you know, in, in, I think, just to put it a bit in, in perspective, you were mentioning that uh, Din uh, is a Sufi, you know? Mm. Um, and he has a teacher. Um, Sufism is about, is about, um, well, in Malay we call it ilmu mengenal diri, yeah? about, about the knowledge of knowing yourself, you know, who you are, where you come from, what you're doing on this earth, and where you're going to. That's what Sufism is all about, you know. That's the main thing. Healing is part of that bigger picture. It's, it's a small part of that, of that whole, yeah, of that whole thing, you know. So what his guru actually teaches is, is um, Sufism. Um, so healing uh, is, is a part of that, you know, almost like a subject. Uh, but he also has a lot of other teachers. You know, I know that he goes out. He learns about herbs from from the Aborigines, you know? um, and he has various gurus all over uh, Malaysia, up north in in, in Perak and Kelantan and all that. You know, so. There's this, this two things which, which um, these two lives which he, he leads, you know. Um, sometimes you would ask whether he, he's an artist who's also a healer, or is he a healer, but, you know, who happens to be an artist, you know. Um, it's very difficult to say, but the, but the real thing about him, I think, is his healing. Mm. Yeah. You know, that, that's him in his natural, um, um, that's how he is naturally, you know, he's a natural healer. Yeah, and I've seen him do it, you know, yeah. He also had a fascination with horses. Eh? With horses? Yeah, with all animals. Mm. With all animals, you know, I think because, um, because of the horses in Singapore, there's a turf club, so it's quite easy for him to get <laughs> horse hair, bones and all that, you know, but yeah. I mean, in, in, in Sufi healing, you know, everything that is on earth has a, a purpose, a function. You know, there's nothing that is useless, you know. In fact, you know, if you look at all the, the medicine in the pharmacy, you know, you have to realize that all of it comes from the earth, you know, initially, yeah. But they have been compounded and, you know, uh, into various uh, portions. But, they all come from the earth, you know. So everything that is natural, you know, um, from plants to trees to, to animals, uh, everything has a purpose. It's just that we do not know. Yeah, but if you do know and you do learn about it, it's a science actually. Um, you'll find that it's quite real. And 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 he moved across the causeway huh? yeah. quite easily. Yeah. Which I think also didn't help because I think he got missed out in Malaysia, but he got missed out in Singapore as well, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Singapore is a city state, you know. For someone like him, his natural environment would be here yeah, in Malaysia. Yeah. In Singapore, it's not a very friendly place if you are into mysticism and, 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 and um, herbs and all that. You know, it's such a modern. Uh, city, yeah, but here in KL, in, in, in Malaysia, you know, especially up north in Kelantan, um, that's much more his kind of place, you know, but I think because he grew up in Singapore, he has his roots there, his children go to school there, his wife is Singaporean, he stays in Singapore, yeah. Maybe we should yeah. have some questions. Any questions or comments? Why 
Why did you choose to do this research on him? Why me? Yeah. Uh, why, why did I? Uh, yeah. I was an undergraduate. I, I needed money. <laughs> and uh, I got into the wrong company. <laughs> Met a, met, a, met a very senior museum curator, his name is Ahmed Mashadi, who knew Dean uh, well. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, he basically took me to Dean's home. And uh, it was very close to the National University of Singapore where I was studying. And uh, yeah, so it was Ahmed Mashadi who really kind so of So what was your first research. impression seeing his artwork? Well, before I went in, I remember something that Ahmad told me. He told me, just make sure you don't stare at things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because you know what to expect. I mean, this is a home that was not like any other home, right? In Singapore, especially where space is so limited. Um, and and, and in, a, in a sense, I think uh, this is where uh, the role of uh, Hamida, you know, the wife, uh, came in because uh, I'm not an art historian, yeah, and neither am I an anthropologist. Um, but so Hamida became a teacher in a sense, you know, teaching me very fundamental things with the difference between oil on canvas and acrylic on canvas. I didn't know these things, and so she would teach me. So in a way, it was also a kind of an exchange and a learning process. So you know, you you you, you give time and you you gain something in return. And uh, there was never any intention to actually curate an exhibition. I, I should be very clear about that. It was simply a way for me to spend my weekends. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the intention was never to, to curate. Yeah, I mean, I think the curatorial is just, okay, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, well, you had a fantastic conversation. And, uh, and, and, and one, one is enriched by that, I suppose. So it's not to get into it just because one can gain something out of it. I hope you understand the, uh, this distinction. It's in the case of Dean. No, yeah. I didn't understand. So in the sense that um, as I begin to document, I just realize that I'm just learning so much, but I will never be able to translate it entirely in the exhibition. Yeah. I understand. So this is the gap. Thank you. I know Simon has a question. <laughs> Actually, thanks for the talk. It's very interesting. Uh, can I sort of like uh, get you to locate this work in relationship to other curatorial projects that you're working on? I understand that you did a, uh, a project that looks at uh, the was it a relocation of a Sufi shrine or the, or the requisition of the land that a Sufi shrine actually sits on? Uh, and it, was that like a series, did, did you, was this a part of a series of sort of like ongoing, um, I guess, curatorial sort of like uh, question about sort of like land locality and, and this other sort of like layer of historical memory in Singapore's sort of urban landscape? Thank you. I, I, I think it's, it, well, it, yeah, so the project that Simon uh, is referring to was something that I did in 2011, and it was titled uh, The Sufi and the Bearded Man, uh, Remembering a Kramat in Contemporary Singapore. And essentially, uh, at this moment in time, one of the things that's happening is that Kramats uh, are, are somewhat under threat, right? Uh, and they're under threat for, 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 for a, a, a gamut of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is, of course, uh, land reuse. And uh, again, uh, I, I met the wrong people, so to speak. Uh, I met a, a historian, uh, Taranjit Sivya, who uh, one day turned up at the museum, and he starts uh, screaming. He's saying, oh, you people, you run this museum, but you know, there's a kramat that's going to be torn down. What are you going to do about it? And of course, I had no response. So, uh, Taranjit Sivya, he's a, he's, he's a historian, right? Of, uh, yeah, yeah, of, of 19th century Malaya. And I said, okay, uh, I'll come with you. Let's go to see what's happening. And there we met this fantastic man, Ali Jangut, right? So, yeah, this is beautiful beard. And, and he was the keeper of the, of the shrine. And it, it, it was a kramat dedicated to a 19th century 
female Baghdadi saint by the name of Siti Maryam. And it was interesting that uh, the saint was female and it had a very large female following. And so we just began to spend time at the, at the Krama for about two and a half years with really no intention again to curate uh, an exhibition. Uh, and then in 2011, the bulldozers came and it was torn down in an afternoon. And then the question arises, right, how does one respond uh, to, to such a moment? And, uh, and I'm Sri Lankan, you see, so in Sri Lanka things tend to get uh, pretty complex, right, if one has followed Sri Lanka's uh, recent history. And, uh, and, and, and so I said, okay, no problem, let's stay calm. Um, and we begin to recover uh, remnants of the Kramat from the, from the, from the, the rubbish dump. And, 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 and we begin to bring these objects into the museum. But then the question is, what are we going to do with these objects? These are just remnants of the shrine itself, right? And uh, so, again, we put them into a room and we waited and we talked and we held all these discussions for a number of months, right, with all sorts of uh, individuals, uh, intellectuals, you know, uh, 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 figures who were very much invested in questions uh, surrounding Sufism in this part of the world. So, you know, people who had knowledge, right, people who had a point of view. And eventually we curated an exhibition. Well, I, I curated the exhibition, which featured photographs, stories, right, from the Kramat alongside the, the relics uh, that I recovered. So in a sense, I think it is an ongoing uh, process of research, but uh, it's not really guided uh, by a kind of a central thesis statement. Yeah, it, it's about really thinking about how one relates to the world and measures oneself in relation to that, right? And how can one bring these conversations into the museum? Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, it's the interest is in what is the space in which we can act? And the museum is maybe one such space in which we can actually act, uh, for better or for worse. Yeah. I just want to sort of like uh, a follow-up question is um, whether you are actually able to create this space in the current museum that you're working in, given that it's a different kind of like institution with a different sort of like mandate, and maybe the modern having a different place out in a very different kind of like register. Yeah. And, and how yeah, are you going to sort of like, you know, negotiate or work around that? I'll just go for it. Um, you know, uh, again, I say I'm Sri Lankan, I can go back and catch fish. Well, I know I won't actually catch fish, I'll get somebody else to catch fish. I, you know, I come from a merchant family. Uh, but the point here is that, uh, uh, well, I work for the National Gallery in Singapore, uh, I, and, and Simon Nobert, uh, seriously, uh, I, I think there is. I think there is. Uh, that's the simple answer. It, it's just that perhaps uh, the terms uh, within which one operates uh, are slightly different. And, and in a sense, I think it's important to also recognize that not all museums are the same, obviously, but they also create platforms. And so again, the space that one is working in, it's, 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 it's a platform at which one can then speak. So, you know, speaking at the National Gallery, for instance, and speaking at NUS Museum are very different things, yeah? I'm not saying one is higher than the other, but has, it comes with its own set of uh, 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 opportunities, I think, and, 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 and productive uh, possibilities, I think. Yeah, so yes, there is, yeah. It's just, it's done differently, yeah. Hi, I'm just curious. Uh, it's very interesting that you brought up his writing in English. So I just wonder, have you compared his writing in Bahasa, in Malay? Or are there any writings by Din in Bahasa? Have you compared them? Uh, uh, well, I've seen, he's, he's written, he, he actually writes um, poems, eh? Saja, yeah. Um, but I don't know if any of them are published. Maybe there's one in, I remember one was published in a catalog. It, it was, uh, there was an exhibition in, in Ipo, I think Pakan Sini Ipo, many years back. I think he wrote uh, like a poem, yeah. But apart from that, I don't see any published, but he does write in Malay. 
Yeah. So if, if I'm, I'm allowed to just pursue, I'm just wondering like the, what he writes in Bahasa and what he writes in English, are they of different uh, subject matter, different type yeah. of things that he talks about? Because it's quite fascinating when mm. uh, Shabir showed the, yeah. what he wrote about Malay art there just now. I think it's very interesting yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is, text. Uh, this is not a translation. Yeah, exactly, like yeah. Unrealized works. Uh, you see this one? Sorry. Oh, so like this is a unrealized sculpture right, that he wanted to make. But all the all the conceptual notes that would accompany his his works are most often, I would say. More than 90%, 9 out of 10 times in English. In English yeah. yeah. So perhaps the poetry. Yeah, because um, when, he, when in the art world, he's dealing with uh, collectors, curators, uh, art historians, you know. So he speaks, uh, he writes in English. And also, a lot of uh, the writings in English are uh, uh, about trying to explain what the art is about, you know what the Chris means, what the Wayang Kulit figures means, what, what certain types of wood, the properties of certain types of uh, wood or boats that he's using, you know. Uh, a lot of that kind of explanation. His writing in Malay is more, um, it's a bit more mystical, you know. Um, a lot is about him and God, you know, that, that kind of thing, yeah. It's a lot more um, personal, yeah. But yeah, I think because I mean, I'm just curious with the idea in a way that Dean is not translating within like languages, but mm. he's actually uh, commanding two different type of languages. It's interesting that when uh, you, you mentioned that he traversed from, from, from Singapore to Johor, as in like he's a figure going through two worlds. But yeah. I would like to reverse that idea and whether it would be interesting. Instead of he is going to two different worlds, I think there is two different worlds inside him. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if that might be in. We were talking over dinner. I mean, he is a contradiction. Thank you. A, a walking contradiction, actually, you know. Um, <laughs> but that, that's what makes the man interesting, yeah? the contradictions. I mean, also, I think uh, keeping up with these two parallel texts, right, mm. which is not easy. And, and, and I think, as you said, right, always attempting to bridge, yeah. but maybe never fully succeeding, yeah. I think. Yeah. And I always also wondered whether the exhibitions that I did with his materials from the home, whether it would have been possible if he had still been around. I don't know. What do you think, Zaki? You knew him well. <laughs> you probably have more. <laughs> more things to show, I think. Yeah. I mean, he's very enthusiastic about showing, you know, and, and exhibiting, you know. Um, um, that, 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 that show at NUS, uh, I think if he was around, it'd probably be a bigger show. Yeah. Question. Hello. Um, I was curious to know a little bit more about his um, Sufi influences in his work. So if you could share a little bit more on that, I'd love that. Um, you can say all, all of the works um, is based on, on Sufism, actually. All of the works, you know. Um, Sufism is based on, on, on the Islamic idea of Tawhid, you know, which is um, unity, you know, uh, diversity and unity, actually. You know? I mean, you are one person, but actually, although you're one person, you're, you're made up of many different things. You, know? you have all kinds of systems in your body, your circulatory system, your skeletal system, you know, your nervous system, you, you have all kinds of organs, you know, but 
all of that constitutes you as one person. You know, so you can say the objects that Muhammad Din uses is that you know, everything in existence is governed by this concept of Tawhid, this unity. Yeah, you just need to have the eyes to see it, you know, and how to link it, how to understand it. You know, so when he makes art, that is basically his starting point. That all of these things are connected. You know, nothing is an island, actually. You know, so, so the recognition of, 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 of all the objects that he uses, you know, and their place in this world. So it's, basically, it's, it's Sufi thinking, actually. Yeah. I think you can see how it relates to how you talk about how he tries to connect the different worlds of his art and his mysticism. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.